Will Michigan open things up when it comes to the offense this year? Kirk Herbstreit is all in on Michigan's potential. And could a former Wolverine play up to eight years going the Van Wilder track? All that on this episode of Locked On Wolverines. You are Locked On Wolverines, your daily podcast on the Michigan Wolverines. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Happy Monday. We are back and doing it. Locked on Wolverines podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. I am your man on the ground, Isaiah Hole, publisher of Wolverines Wire through USA Today Sports Media Group. And I was on the ground on Thursday. We talked to Jim Harbaugh. We discussed that a little bit on Thursday night's episode. And uh, I want to get to some a little bit of uh, more into this offensive uh, identity potential shift. Uh, which we we covered very briefly on Thursday. Uh, so I, we can go a lot more in depth. So uh, if you missed it, Jim Harbaugh said that he is hoping uh, that this is a little bit more of a balanced offense in terms of in attempts of passing and in attempts of rushing. Uh, I know certainly there's been mixed reviews to that. There are some people who say, hey, you got running backs, run the ball. Uh, it goes a lot deeper than that, in my opinion, right? Like there there's present, future, uh, a lot of different things that kind of go into the capability um, that Michigan would have, right? So first off, one of the reasons why I think it's really important that uh, Jim Harbaugh says that they need to be a bit more balanced, that once you go back at the end of the season and look at how many pass attempts versus rush attempts, that it's about 50-50, is because you're not going to keep attracting top quarterback talent uh, if you are just going to be a run first team, yeah, you could go and get a, a maybe like a middling four star in that case. But right now, Michigan has a five star. They should utilize that five star. They will have Jaden Davis, who's another five star. They'll want to be able to utilize said five star. They want to get Bryce Underwood, uh, who they went and saw on Thursday, who has been to campus seven times in, in order to get the top quarterback in the country. You need to be able to go out there and sling it. I understand you have Donovan Edwards, Blake Corum. These are two two types of guys that Michigan has not had in quite some time. Uh, But at the same time, you have J.J. McCarthy, who is the type of quarterback that you haven't had in some time as well. You need to be able to utilize all of these weapons because it helps you not only currently, but it helps you in the future as well. Because if you open things up a little bit this year, because yes, you look you look forward to maybe next year. Let's say J.J. McCarthy leaves, Donovan Edwards, Blake Corum, they both leave, and you decide to plug in Jaden Davis uh, as a year one guy. You decide not to go with Davis Warren or Alex Orgy, uh, whoever you might have back there uh, that maybe could run the show for a year while Jaden Davis gets his uh, his bearings. Uh, but you know, you don't necessarily have the running back. So you sit, sit there and say, okay, well, they got CJ Stokes and, uh, you know, Jordan Marshall's a freshman. Say they get Taylor Tatum. Maybe they just don't have quite uh, the horses that they've had and, and they feel like they, they need to throw the ball. It, it might not work quite out, uh, out quite as well, right? You need a little bit of balance. And I know that's a very poor analogy here, but you, you need the balance. Uh, and I think that it's good to be able to show running backs, hey, we have a commitment to running the football, but you need to show quarterbacks we have a commitment to throwing the football. Now, on top of that, let, let's let's be honest. It's also really difficult to defend, right? Like now Michigan last year certainly ran the ball sometimes, I felt, when they didn't necessarily need to. I, I felt like for a while against Penn State, now they ran for 400 yards against Penn State in 2021 or 2022. I, I felt like, they were running and in, not into a brick wall. They were having decent success. But, you know, you look at like the end zone. Uh, they, I think they ran it uh, three straight times before they got a touchdown on the goal line. Uh, if memory serves, which it probably does not. It's uh, one of those things where I felt like they were trying to make a point to Penn State. Oh, you've got the the top rush defense in the conference right now, huh? Oh, you're, you're really improved. We're going to do it anyway. We're going to break your will. And that's fine. They're going to do that at times. But and, you know, it's, it's one thing it really takes someone's manhood, a team's manhood 
when it's a situation where, hey, we know they're going to run it. We know that where they're going to run it and we still can't stop it. Right. That certainly takes a team's manhood. But when you have as many weapons as Michigan currently has on offense, you need to be able to utilize them all because you don't want to only you want to win games. Yes. But you want to be able to win games with different elements, right? Think back to how much we've talked about uh, the John Beeline uh, basketball teams, right? Where it was like, okay, you're going to go ahead and shut down, uh, you know, you're going to shut down Mo Wagner. Cool. Well, we've got four other guys that can hurt you. You know, there, that was, that was, you know, going to work Pistons was definitely that, right? Oh, you're going to shut down Rip Hamilton this game. Well, Chauncey's going to hurt you. Rasheed's going to hurt you. You're going to shut down Ben Wallace? Well, Tayshawn Prince, he's going to hurt you. That type of thing. It's, it's the same thing with the, with the football team. Certainly, we saw that a bit against Ohio State, right? We saw this, uh, oh, you're going to shut down uh, Donovan Edwards. Well, Cornelius Johnson exists. Colston Loveland exists. Oh, now you're going you're, you're gonna to try to pay attention to, to the pass game? Well, now Donovan Edwards is going to take off for 75 and 85 yards. That is is a key, and I think it's important that Michigan gets there sooner this year just for the sake of really opening things up because I think that things need to be a lot more open when you get to the college football playoff if you can get there again for a third straight year. Uh, But I think it it pays a lot of dividends also for some of those guys, for the Bryce Underwoods of the world who are sitting there looking and saying – Do I really want to go to Michigan? Because if he's the top quarterback in the country, he's going to have some opportunities. And I don't think he's going to want to necessarily go someplace that's going to say, yeah, you're going to come here. You're going to throw for 2,600 yards a year uh, for two or three years. And uh, yeah, that'll be it. So good luck. You need to be able to showcase that you can put a quarterback in the league as well, right? Like J.J. McCarthy isn't going to want to just be like, yep, I came to Michigan. I was a sixth rounder. That worked out great. You know, Michigan needs, they're, they're getting better, right? In a lot of ways, they're, they're putting offensive linemen in, into the league. They're putting running backs into the league. They, they're, they're putting receivers into the league. They just need to elevate the offense a bit more because it's going to be a lot more difficult to reel in the top talent in the country. You're not going to be able to convince a Ryan Wingo five-star wide receiver to come when your top wide receiver is a seventh round pick, nearly Mr. Irrelevant, right? While it's great, you can sit there and point like, Hey, he got into the league. What did you do with their last five-star wide receiver? Well, Donovan Peoples Jones was a sixth round pick. You know, you've got to be able to showcase these guys a little bit more and it will pay dividends on the field, right? As Jim Harbaugh said, it's going to be awfully hard to defend us when we are spreading the ball out. You know that Blake Corum is going to get 10 touches. Donovan Edwards is going to get 10 touches. Uh, Cornelius Johnson and Roman Wilson and Colston Loveland are each going to get six. Uh, you, you know that that they're going to those touches are going to come. You just don't know when, and you also don't necessarily know how. This is the next step of evolution for the Michigan offense, and it's good to hear that it's happening instead of just a. Uh, uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna give the ball to the fullback, but he's gonna be lined up in a different place. They're gonna do stuff like that too. But being able to move the offense to the next step, because we've talked for a while this offseason about how national championship winning teams have those top tier offenses. Michigan's not lagging super far behind. They're twenty fourth in the country. Uh, In 25th, I believe, the year before, or 24th, I think, each of the last two years. Georgia was 25th two years ago and won the national championship. But you need to evolve the pass game. You just do. We Like we've talked about, when it comes to the uh, the Georgias of the world, uh, yeah, they, they didn't have the most high-flying pass game uh, in 2021. Certainly, it hurt Michigan. Stetson Bennett was making incredible throws in that game. But... You look at what Stetson Bennett did last year. You look at what Alabama has turned into. You look at what LSU was, which is the high, high standard. I mean, there there was no team better in 2019 LSU. Uh, You look at what Ohio State, granted, Ohio State hasn't won a national championship in nine years, but you need the offense to go along with the defense. That's just the world of of college football now. It's not going to be one elite side of the ball and the other side is okay. Sometimes it might be a little bit that, right? Like, 
Georgia in 2021, but that offense was still top tier. They just also had a <laughs> elite, elite, elite tier defense to go along with it. So that is what they need to do. All right. We are going to move on. Uh, Kirk Herbstreet is all in when it comes to the uh, to Michigan really going very, very deep and having that type of a team that could win it all. Well, let's let's hear his comments or read his comments rather and react to that. And we will continue on here in just a moment. Before we do that, listen, make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs because right now new customers can get a no sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's $2,500 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. So how many of you were sitting there betting that uh, Duncan Robinson was just going to take over and uh, even the series uh, against uh, against the Nuggets? You know, you if you were betting Michigan guys, which there's only one in the NBA playoffs, then you know what? You either win big or you get that money back. Uh, the great thing I love about it is there's great promotions every single day. It's a safe and secure app. And the most important thing, you get paid easily, uh, instantly rather. Uh, there's no better place to bet all of the playoff action than America's number one sports book. Uh, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Get a no sweat first bet up to $2,500. It's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, I know as usual, I promised big things over the weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, a funny thing happened on the way to uh, to Friday's episode. Not funny. Not, not really. Not funny. Ha ha. Um, Y'all know how, uh, if you've been a long time watcher or listener, then you know that I have a an allergy to field turf. And uh, while I did take Benadryl with me uh, to and took some Benadryl at the camps on Thursday, Apparently, when you're on a field all day long, it uh, and you, you don't constantly take Benadryl, and you have my condition, it debilitates you. And so I don't know if there are anyone out there, any allergists that watch or listen to the show. If you could reach out to me, you could figure out how to make this not awful because it felt like what it used to feel like when I drink. Um, uh, I, I you know you go on a, a little bit of a bender, you have like 12, uh, 12 beers in a day that are, you know, not just, uh, not just Bud Light, you know, you're, you're at a party on a Saturday and, and you're sitting there having a craft beer every, uh, you know, one or two, every couple hours before you know it, you've gotten carried away. And then the next day you just feel absolutely, uh, demolished. That's how I felt Friday and Saturday just wrecked. So my apologies. Um, nonetheless, let's move on. Uh, Kirk Herb Street. Uh, he talked to JD Piquel, uh, acquaintance of mine over at on three. Uh, and he, uh, he, this is what he had to say. He was asked about, uh, what does, can Michigan get over the playoff hump in 2023? Thanks to Trent Noop for transcribing this. <laughs> uh, he said, you know, when I hear over the hump, I think they should have been in on the national champ or been in the national championship last year. Don't we all? I mean, I respect TCU, but let's face it. I think you and I and everybody watched that game. We were impressed with what we saw from TCU that game and the way they made so many explosive plays. But going into it, I think if we thought about it, Michigan was going to win the game. So to think, what do they have to do to get over the hump? I would have said that after they lost to Georgia in 2021 and the fashion in which they did. But uh, against TCU, man, I just feel like a couple plays here or there. I don't think they'd change a whole lot of anything. Uh, so continuing on, he said, you mentioned the ones who punch in the backfield and the way they've recruited in recent years, and they've got great skill on the outside. They're always going to have linemen. And then JJ, I think, is proving himself to be a guy that you can win a lot of games with. So I think they're in a great spot. They get Ohio State at home. Uh, Jim, I feel, has taken this program to the highest level it's been at since he's been in Ann Arbor. If they can stay healthy, they're going to have a real shot this year. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that he's seeing what most of us are seeing. And I think it's funny every time that, you know, even on this article, you see, uh, you know, you go to go to Facebook and somehow it finds itself in Buckeye and uh, the Michigan State circles. I find it funny when the Michigan State people are like laughing at it and commenting, you like, oh, you play East Carolina. Well, you know what? That's fine. <laughs> you know, like 
They're, they're, you know, it's not East Carolina that they have to worry about as much as Penn State and Ohio State. If they beat those two teams, guess what? They'll probably be in a really good situation. Um, so uh, I, I fully agree, right? Like the TCU game, it really did. Like if JJ doesn't have those two pick sixes, game's completely different, especially the second one. Like, yeah, the first one, things started, you know, s- snowballing out of control, uh, you know, if Michigan scores a touchdown or even a field goal on that first uh, first possession or, you know, they score a touchdown or a field goal on the, uh, well, it was a touchdown, the Roman Wilson play uh, that got called back. I mean, just some of those things go differently. I mean, some of that's a boneheaded coaching decision. Some of that is, uh, you know, player errors. You just turn around a couple of those things, maybe even just one of them. Maybe you just take away that, that uh second J.J. McCarthy pick six and Michigan might win that game. I mean, heck, they even had the ball in their hands with uh, with the final 30 seconds uh, with the capability of winning it. So uh, I I think that Michigan is right there. Now, would they how would they have fared against Georgia? That's anybody's guess. And certainly there's going to be people out there that look at it and say, well, they, they probably would have gotten beaten pretty bad. Ohio State's the only one, blah, blah, blah. Listen, I think Ohio State doesn't have the same defense that Michigan does. I think Michigan would have been able to keep them in check. And I think TCU kind of put everything into uh, their, uh, you know, as far as will and game plan and all of it into the Michigan game. Getting to the national championship was it. They weren't happy to be there for the college football playoff semifinal, but they certainly were for the national championship against Georgia. So uh, I I don't know what it would have been like. Michigan certainly had its eyes more on the national championship, it seemed. But I do think Michigan's got everything that it needs. I think it's all contingent, though, on everything we talked about in segment one. Michigan needs to be able to go out there and do more offensively. I'm not really worried about the defense. And we'll see if, you know, if there's any... Changes Jim Harbaugh feels good about what he has at uh, at cornerback. Uh, if they bring in Josh Wallace, I mean, it's still going to be a tough pull. He's got uh, a co- coaches from his high school at the Matha that are at Virginia Tech, uh, so it, it's it, it's going to be still tough. But I mean, you bring in Josh Wallace, suddenly this thing looks really good top to bottom on the defensive side. Uh, offensively, it already looks good too. It's just a matter of will they? They can. But will they? And then obviously just playing, you know, I think the big thing that Kirk brought up that is important is being able to uh, stay healthy, right? You know, things probably would have been different against TCU if Blake Corum's out there. I mean, Donovan Edwards busted out a, a really good run to begin with and then kind of was quiet for much of the rest of the game. Uh, if uh, Blake Corum's out there, that's probably not happening. I mean, heck, if Donovan Edwards has a healthy hand, you know, you you put him in different matchup situations. You put Blake and Donovan out there, which I hope we'll finally see this year at the same time. There's a lot that can go right. Roman Wilson, if he stays healthy for an entire year, maybe he does look like I've been calling him Diet Devontae Smith. There's a lot that can go really right. Michigan's got to utilize everything it can and stay healthy because I'm not surprised that Ohio State kind of faltered last year without, uh, you know, without Jackson Smith and Jigba, even though he might not have been their best wide receiver. You know, Marvin Harrison certainly gets those accolades. But that's the type of thing that's happened to Michigan over the years. One one key guy goes down and it all falls apart. Now, last year they didn't really have a key guy go down except for Blake Horn right before Ohio State. They still made do, of course. Uh, two years ago, it was uh, Ronnie Bell goes down uh, in the same early fashion uh, as, uh, you know, as uh, Jackson Smith and Jigba. But if you can keep the nucleus of the team, particularly quarterback, I would say the running backs, I don't know that they can afford uh, a major injury at wide receiver either. I think they'll, they'll be in pretty good, a pretty good spot. Cornerback is probably the only other place that I feel a little iffy about, but I'm still, I th- I think they've got some guys there who can be studs. We just haven't seen them do that yet. Anyway, all right, let's move on to the uh, the last topic of the day. A former Michigan player about to enter his seventh year as he commits to another school. Apparently eight years available. Let's get to that momentarily. All 
All right, so the rest of the week, we're going to start getting into uh, some of the... I haven't re really checked to see if I can clean up the audio, if we'll be able to actually have the audio uh, from some of these... Uh, some of these guys that I talked to, I talked to, I think, four or five guys at the Will Johnson camp. Uh, I think it's going to be good enough for most of them. We'll try to figure that out, but we're, that's what we're going to talk about for most of the rest of the week. I do still have a mailbag from last week we're going to get to. Uh, we're going to double up one of these days to, to make that happen, and then we'll try to do another mailbag at the end of the week. That is the goal. Uh, FYI, now that I am not on a football field and I'm not dying to death. Um, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of you are wondering, how is it that I'm a photographer on a football field and I'm allergic to said football field? It's not fun. That's why I love going to Penn State. Grass field. It's amazing. All right. Uh, so, um, Philip Paya, who, uh, hails from the West coast of Michigan, I believe Barry in Springs, if memory serves, uh, he came into Michigan as an offensive lineman, converted a defensive line. Uh, I sat next to him on the Hulk roller coaster at Universal Studios in 2019 when I went on that roller coaster with the line. So I was looking directly at him because uh, I wanted to see. Uh, th they didn't know that that co uh, coaster launches in the middle of the hill. And so that was fun. Uh, but he had transferred. Uh, after never never playing a down for Michigan to Utah State, where he played for one year and three games, uh, I believe injuries precluded him from playing again last year at Utah State. Uh, but I mean, he had an interception. He had a, he had a couple of really big plays uh, over there for the Aggies. Are they the Aggies? Utah State? I'm not sure. And um, and he uh, he went back into the transfer portal and committed to. Oklahoma. He joins fellow former Wolverine Andrell Anthony. Neither of them were Wolverines at the same time, uh, but uh, unless you count maybe like a month or two in the off season, but uh, they they are going to be together at uh, Oklahoma. He's playing under Brent Venables. It's an elite school, but it's a program that I think is. Falling on some hard times. Certainly, they could use a, a guy who played in the Big Ten, even if he didn't face Big Ten competition on the field itself. But when he, he put it that he was in the transfer portal, I'm going into this here, and I'm noticing that he, he said, like, I'm entering myself into the transfer portal. I have two years of eligibility remaining. Now, here's one thing about Philippaya. He was from the class of 2017. 2017. So think about the types of guys who were in 2017. Joe Honigford was around. He, he's finally leaving. He was a 2017 player, and we felt like he was the elder statesman. He was old, and yet Phil, Phil Pia still has two more years. Other guys that were in 2017, Donovan Peoples-Jones. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's, it's wild to think, that, uh, to, to think that there's still someone around from that class, let alone someone who has two more potential years. I just want to look at this real fast because it, it, it's crazy. Donovan Peoples-Jones, Cesar Ruiz, Ambry Thomas. Now, Chuck Filiaga, he was a 2017 guy. He just finished his college career. Um, Oliver Martin's been still around. He was a 2017 guy. Uh, Jalen Kelly Powell was still around last year. He was a 2017 guy. Jalen Kelly Powell, who's now coaching at Dwayne State uh, under... Uh, Tyler Owen Wheatley, uh, Donovan Jeter, Benjamin St. Juiced, Andrew Stuber, Brad Hawkins, Quiddy Pay, Ben Mason, Brad Robbins, who also just left. So COVID year really affecting it. I think it's just wild to think that he could play. He's going into year seven right now, you know, and, and uh, he could have year eight, really the Van Wilder track. When it comes to it, but I wish him all the best. That's just, that's, that's cool. Hopefully he actually comes on strong. But when you think like 2017, he's 18, he, he might be a 26 year old college football player, but I hope it works out and he can get to that next, next level. And I was right. Barry and Springs is where he was from. So memory actually did serve there. All right. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We will be back with, uh, tomorrow we'll do, uh, we'll t double it up. We'll do, uh, We'll start getting into some of the, the things that I spoke to uh, 
some of those guys, CJ Stokes had, I think the best interview he was great, but I also want to talk about, you know, Keon Sab and Derek Moore had some really good things to say as well. Uh, so we'll get into those guys and then we'll also do the mailbag. That is the plan for the week. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you again soon. Peace.